All right, we should be recording now. Uh, so welcome everyone to Cheat Codes for Clean Code. Um, this is going to be a, a Hello World workshop kind of about documentation, uh, best practices and writing readmes and all the sort of things to make your code more readable to other people. So um, we're actually gonna be taking a look mainly, I, it, when I first sort of envisioned this workshop, I was like, hey, maybe I can just do a bunch of slides about all the different things you should do. Um, but I decided instead to go for like more of an example based approach, because um, I think that's more sort of easier to see how you how you sort of apply these things, because I feel like a lot of times uh, slide workshop thoughts of slides people kind of get uh, lost into how to convert that into the real world. So um, definitely, if you have any questions throughout, go ahead and ask during the chat. Um, and if you want to follow along, I'm going to be adding kind of documentation to one of my personal projects. So you can head over to, I'll put this link in the chat, this, this Steel Lang project. Um, and this is a programming language project that I've been building over a while now, I guess. It's almost, I guess, two or three years old, maybe. Um, but I don't often have time to get back and work on it, unfortunately. Um, it's written in TypeScript. And I just made this public, so you should be able to clone it. Um, or just download you want to take a look around at it um it's it's heavily heavily undocumented so it has some comments here and there uh, but there's a lot of things that need to be fixed it's also written over such a long time that there's kind of some inconsistencies so i'm going to talk about all of that and what you can do to actually make like if you have an old project that you want to update with documentation want to do and then also as you're developing a project what the right things to do are in order to make it um easy to read so you can head to that link uh clone the project I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. It's all text, so it should be relatively fast. All right, so uh, this is a um, programming language. So like, just like C or Java or something like that, this project is, is aimed at being like a language you can use to do things. Um, a lot of stuff isn't fleshed out, you know, a lot of stuff's still being built. Um, but if you want to actually try to run it, what you'll need to do is run npm i or npm install in the main directory. So head, clone the project, head to the main directory, uh, run npm install. It should be relatively fast. And then if you run npm start, you can get um, kind of a, a REPL or like an interactive uh, sort of area. So like you can do math. If you want to evaluate math expressions, um, you can assign variables, right? And then use the results of those variables and it will tell you what it evaluates to. Um, let's see, what are some other features? You can define functions. So this is like a simple sum function, right? It takes in A and B. This notation might be a little unfamiliar, but the sum is just a function that takes in A and B and gives you back A plus B. So you can define that. Um, oh, it didn't like that. Some things may not be working the best right now. But regardless, there's a lot of different things you can do. Okay, so let's actually take a, the first thing you wanna do for a project that if you're gonna put it on GitHub um, is likely create a README. So you can actually see GitHub prompt is prompting me to do this, add a README. Um, and this is just sort of a file that explains to other people what your project is, you know, how to get it installed, set up, uh, maybe some other information. This is sort of the thing people, main thing people will see. This is this actually will get rendered onto the main GitHub page. So it's important that you actually put like engaging content on there. Um, so to actually do that, you just need to open a readme.md file in the root of your project. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so at .md, if you're not familiar, that stands for markdown. And I can actually send you a link to at least GitHub sort of short tutorial on Markdown. Markdown is great. It's basically a, a very simple language um, for, for applying some basic formatting to text. So it's very, it's very much like plain text driven. Um, and this is sort of like the default format people use for GitHub readmes. So you can, if you just want to type, if you just want to type regular text, you can type regular text. Um, you can use, you know, stars to, for bold and italics. Uh, you can add links, you can embed things, do lists. It's, it's a lot of sort of things that map sort of to HTML. You can do block quotes um, and then code also. So to write your README, so you can sort of read through this if you want and see all the different things you can do. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time covering that. 
Uh, but if we want to actually write a README, uh, the first thing you should do is kind of set a, a big heading for whatever your project is. So I'm just going to call this uh, Steel because that is like the name of my project. Um, but of course, you can you put whatever the name of your project is for the heading. This single hash is kind of represents um, like it, it, will, it will compile to an H1 tag in HTML. So it's just like your big, broadest, largest heading. And then underneath that, you might want to have some subsections. So uh, usually a good one to put at the very top is like an installation. So you can see, right, for this project, we had to clone it. Uh, did I clone it in here? We had, to, we had to clone it. And then we had to do npm install. So it's a good idea to sort of put these commands into your readme. Um, Again, people who are sort of familiar with how the NPM ecosystem works or how Git works will probably already know how to do this, but it never hurts to have these included. So, or I'd say something like to install steel, uh, run the following commands. For beginners especially, like one of the hardest things can be to get something installed. So useful install instructions can be great. Um, so if you want to have code into like a, um, a markdown file, you can do these this triple back tick. So you do triple back tick at the beginning, triple back tick at the end, and all that together, uh, that will make everything inside of their inline code. And we'll see sort of when we push this up to GitHub, you'll see how this sort of renders. Um, okay, so we want to clone the project and then you need to change directory into the project and then run npm install. All right, so we kind of have that. Um, that's great. If you want, you can put a like a dollar sign in front to show, so show bash, but it's not super important. All right, so let's just go ahead and let's let's add commit and push that. I'm actually going to make a new branch for this because um, I may not want to include all the things from this workshop into my main branch. So let's make a, a docs branch. All right, and so let's add this. Right, I'm going to push that up. So if we head over to GitHub now and head over to uh, the docs branch, let's see, we might need to reload so it pops up. Yes, so by default, your branch is going to be master or main, whatever your software set it up as. Um, and so, but what, I, and so normally you'd put this on that main branch. So you can see, okay, here's the readme right here, and you can see how things sort of show up. So you get the big heading, you get the smaller heading. Um, and then you also get these this installation instructions. Okay, so that's great. Uh, we also usually you usually want to put something about like what your project is. So we have steel and we say how to install it, but like do people actually know what this is? Because um, otherwise people aren't going to go through the effort to actually look at your project. So let's see. I might say something like um, steel is an in development programming language designed for ease of use, something like that. You can always do something longer, but. Okay, so add that, commit that, push that up. Uh, we reload. Okay, there you go. Um, you also might wanna put some other thing, good things to put is your license. So people can go find the license section, but it's always nice to include a little licensing statement at the bottom, just for people who are looking for that. Okay, um, that's nice. Let's see, what else can we include? We probably should also include under installation, uh, or you can, so you can do this a few different ways. Some people put it under installation, other people do like a getting started. It's really up to you, but you want to have maybe you want to say how to install something and then how to actually run it. So this tells them how to install it. But again, if you're not familiar with how npm works, you might not know that npm start is sort of the default way um, to get something running. So you say uh, npm start. So okay, so to use the the repo. Um, 
we say run npm start. And then there's also an option uh, to write a file and use use a file as sort of like if you want to actually write code in this language, um, then you can use a file as well. So file, give a different, very similar thing for that. You just run npm start. Um, I believe it's dash dash in the file. Let's actually test that because I don't quite remember. So let's make just let's just make a simple program. I don't remember if you need the dash dash or not. I think you do. Yeah. Okay. So you can see that you can write a simple program to print hello world. Uh, that's nice. Okay. So yeah, you just need to do dash dash in the file name. So let's go back to our README. Awesome. And if you want, you can also include demos. So some projects will have like a, an examples directory where you include demos or whatever. Um, but I'm not going to do that at least for now. That's good though. Let's, so let's add README and let's get rid of that file. We don't need that. Okay. Um, so what do we do? We added, added license, add more to. Okay. So we've got that. Um, one thing I would strongly encourage you to do if you really want to engage with people is consider adding a, a GIF to your, um, your main page. So what I mean by this, you can actually embed GIFs inside of this and people really seem to like those because um, it sort of catches your eye when you have like, this is just static text and it's like, okay. Um, but if you have like an image or um, GIFs that sort of show that thing actually being used, then people tend to think that it's better. Um, and so I always recommend you do that. So I have actually prepared a, a GIF. So let's go grab that. Um, so the way you do this is you just need to copy the GIF file somewhere into your project. And then in your markdown file, um, you can actually include. So I think a good place, where do you think a good place for this to go? Probably you want it near the top. I'm probably underneath this section right here. So like right before installation to sort of catch the eye of the user. Um, so here, the way you would include that is you do this exclamation mark, um, then you provide some alt text. So uh, like this is sort of mostly an accessibility thing, but also if the like image doesn't render properly, it might show up. It's basically a description of what's showing. So um, you can say, uh, all right, and then, then you do parentheses and inside there you put a, a link to your, to your GIF. So let's do this. All right, so if we add that um, and you just commit all those files in. Yeah, so let's see if this works. So push that up. All right, let's reload and see. Nope, I don't think, I must've gotten the syntax slightly off. Again, everyone, there's lots of different flavors of Markdown. Oh, I don't think you put it in the quotes. That's what it is. Okay, no quotes, let's try that. So let's see, is that, okay, here we go. So you can render that in, um, again, it's, it's, it's very, when you go to the page and you see sort of like a little animated thing showing you how the program works, it just sort of grabs uh, user attention and makes them more interested in your project. So I encourage you to do that. Um, just do, even, even if it's a simple tempo like this, like, okay, this just creates a variable and stores a number and then adds, adds a number to it. But something like, it just makes the whole page feel a little bit more exciting. Um, so yeah, and Markdown makes it really easy to do this. Uh, this is pretty much like, I feel like the bare essentials of what you need for a, a readme file. But of course, like if you go to a project that has a lot of, a lot more things going on, you can have all kinds of more instructions or links to other documents. Like, um, let's take a look at, let's see, like here's, here's a readme that I always thought was well done. Um, this is a project that um, it's a it's a Vim plugin that you can use uh, to like. It's basically you know how you can install install various plugins in VS Code, for example, to like link your code and like check for errors and things like that. This is a plugin for Vim you can do that with. 
And I always thought this preview is very well done. So you can see the title, you have sort of pictures and example of sort of how it works, um, lots of information. And then you can have a whole table of linking all, to all the different sections, you know, an FAQ, all the stuff that you would need to sort of show, okay, how do you set the tool up? How do you install it? Um, you know, common problems, things like that. So yeah, and the thing is like, if without this readme, would you know how to set this project up or use it? Probably not. Um, so they are very important because you can't just assume that you, cause you know how to use your project, other people will be able to. Okay, so that's a readme file. Um, they are important, but I'm not gonna spend too much more time in that. You sort of get the idea what you need to do for that. What I wanna do at this point is actually start delving into the code. So, Let's actually take a look at, let me walk you through the structure of this project. Um, so if you kind of look, you have a lot of some basic and some base directory, you have a license, uh, readme, um, node modules, your usual just dependencies, more node things. Um, and then you have this source folder and this test folder. Um, so different projects have different standards depending on what kind of project you're doing. If you're doing like a React project, you have one sort of directory structure or you have a backend project with whatever different stack all the different stacks have different sort of uh, structures, but usually the source folder is like a good sign of where the main code is. Um, and then test is usually for like unit tests. So if we want to head into the source directory, you can see that basically this whole project is just a bunch of TypeScript files. And if you're not familiar with TypeScript, don't worry. It's basically just JavaScript, but with some types. Um, if you're familiar with Java, it kind of feels a lot like Java sometimes. Um, it also, but it feels a lot like JavaScript as well. So you can see all these different files. Now for larger projects, the number of files you might have, you might have more folders here. So I don't actually have any sub direct, uh, subfolders. We might create some later if we have time, but um, you might have subfolders with things in it. And uh, I, know, I, I know for me at least, trying to understand a new project, finding where sort of the root, the root uh, file is, like where does everything all start? Um, can be kind of difficult. So that also could be something you can put in your readme, um, like sort of the layout of the project. Something else people do sometimes is a, a contributing.md. And basically what that will have is information for people who want to try to contribute. So maybe most people are just going to use your project. They don't care how it works or how any of that works. So you can have another, another file um, in your sort of root directory that describes all these things. But the way this project actually works is, um, I believe actually, I haven't used this in a while. Uh, oh, let's go into that folder. I believe this main is where everything starts. Yeah. So uh, you can see this obviously can't be the whole program, right? But this is sort of where everything starts is the main. And I encourage you to use a name like main for your entry point if you can, um, because then if for people looking at the project, that's likely for them to guess where things are going to start out. If not, make sure you do document that somewhere. Um, so you can see uh, basically all this file does, it's, this is kind of a, just a stub file. So it just reads in arguments from the command line. So if you had a file name, like it checks. So you can see if there's only two arguments, like two things like npm start written out, then it will just start the, the REPL. Um, but if there's more, then it will try to read a file and try to read in a string there um, and then run that. So, but notice there's no comments at all in this file. And if you don't, if you're not familiar with Node, like even me looking at this, I don't know when I wrote this, probably years ago, um, but it's not particularly intuitive what's going on. So let's add uh, some comments or at least a comment to kind of describe what's going on. Probably one comment is good enough for this file, maybe a few. Um, you wanna be careful to write, not writing too many comments either. Cause if you comment, sometimes I see people do things like this. Um, Okay, and these kind of comments make me sad because this, this doesn't give you any information that you didn't already have before, right? Start REPL, it's pretty clear that that's going to start the REPL somehow. And so a comment that says that, not productive. Um, so I make, comments are very much a thing. People, some people say you can never have too many comments or have lots of comments. I do think you can have too many comments. You need to be strategic about how you use your comments. And the other thing is, you don't wanna spend all of your time writing comments. If you're writing a comment for every single line of code, it's, it's just going to take you much longer to write your code. So you just wanna get, it, comments are sort of a bang for the buck thing. You wanna put, you wanna put comments in when you really think they're going to help the comprehension of people reading your code. 
Um, but don't don't overwhelm the user with lots and lots of comments. There's some other problems with too many comments as well we'll get into, but this is one of them. Okay, so don't do something like this. But we can basically say something like here, like um, if no file name, start REPL, right? And so this, because this right here is sort of an obtuse uh, line. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense what's going on there. And then down here, I think I would argue that this is probably okay to avoid using a um, any comments for this at all. Because if you look, it reads pretty, you can kind of understand what's going on. Okay, you get a file name, um, and then we're going to do this fs.read file. So file system.read file, and then we're going to run it. Um, so I would argue that with this, this is, you know, fairly reasonably, this is, this is a, a solid amount of comments for this file. You don't want to overwhelm people. Okay, so that's pretty good. Uh, let's see. So actually, what you want to do here, let's go from here and see where this actually takes us. So where are these, where is this run or this start REPL actually coming from? Well, you can see those are imported from the steel file. So let's head over to there. Okay. You can see this has, this file is a little bit bigger. Um, we have some more imports. It's still pretty small, only 45 lines. Here, we're going to, let's talk about doing function comments. So a lot of people say that you should comment every one of your functions and I don't necessarily believe that you need to comment every single one of your functions, but I think most functions probably do deserve a comment, especially in a project that reaches a certain level of maturity. Um, so the best way to, to, to write comments in a lot of languages is to do this, this star star format. If you've never seen this before, it, it's gonna look a lot like the kind of standard multi-line comment, but you add an extra star. And this doesn't actually mean anything, right? This is like stars another character, you can put it inside your multi-line comment. But what this will do is a lot of tooling will pick up on this as indicating that it's a documentation comment. So I'll show you the difference, at least in my editor. Different editors will do this different ways. But um, if you do this, okay, you don't really get any special behavior. Um, if you hover over something, you just get sort of the built-in uh, tool tip that shows you the things. But if you put the, the second star, okay, and you hover over something, um, it, it will, you're a lot of different tooling. Again, this doesn't have any real meaning in the language, but a lot of different tooling will assume that comment is associated with the function or constant or, or variable right below it, and it will actually attach it for your hover. Um, so this is super useful because now this works even in other files. Like if we go, let's head back out here, right? And now if we hover over, what was that? Hold on, <laughs> what did I just edit? Start REPL, okay? So let's go to start REPL here. We have over here, you can see we get that comment over in our other file. And this will work, if this doesn't work on your editor, you can probably get plugins to do it. Um, but yeah, this is super useful because now you can sort of, people who are trying to read your code can hover on the various things and get an idea of what they're supposed to do. So that's great. Um, Let's add, let's actually make this a useful comment. So what this start REPL actually does um, is it basically just, it uses a, a is it a built-in node module? I don't remember. Um, but it uses a node module to, to sort of set up this prompt. So you can see right there, that's that little arrow that shows up when we run npm start. Um, then it prompts and it's gonna read in input and give that out to the user. So let's sort of describe this here. Um, Really, you could, you could go with something simple like starts um, the REPL. But again, I don't, I don't believe in writing comments like this because it doesn't, it doesn't add a lot of that information to what you already have. You know it starts the REPL just based on the name. So instead, use your comment space to describe uh, potential pitfalls or, or other information that should be known about the, the, um, the function. So in this case, we're using the I know this because I wrote this. Um, so this is using the, the RL is standing for read line. Um, so it's using this read line API that's in node um, to set up a prompt for the REPL. And this I think is a lot more useful because now that provides you a new piece of information that you didn't have before. The other thing that's common in these functions is to use these like at params. Um, so what at param does is this lets you set your parameter or your argument, right? So we only have one parameter here, it's this RL. 
Um, and if you're not familiar with this syntax, don't worry, this is just a, a type annotation. So in TypeScript, you have types, that's why it's called TypeScript. Um, but this RL is just of type any. I probably could make this something better, but yeah. So don't worry too much about that. If you're not familiar with this colon thing, you can kind of just ignore it and think of it as RLs are one argument. So there's different syntaxes depending on the tooling you want to use. Um, what I recommend is if you want to uh, use this, find tooling um, that can generate like a, a website for your documentation. So I know like Java has the Java doc, which is a big one, um, but there's, this, is, there's, this exists for lots of languages. You can actually find tools that will run through all of your files, read these various uh, comments, and then it can actually generate like HTML documentation. And you've probably, if you've gone through this, like you can just go to, go to the Java, let's go to the Java doc so you can sort of see that. Um, let's see, let's just go to the, the Java doc about strings. Okay, so this is the Java doc. And this, this entire website is actually automatically generated um, by the tooling out of those comments. And this is great, because then you don't have to write a website for your documentation. You can just have it generated for you. Uh, it's very nice. You can see they have all these different arguments and it makes it unclickable. So like if you want to click into it and go to the more detailed version or you want to, you're like, oh, what is this char sequence? Let's click that um, and you can you can look through that and click on more things. And so, yeah, it, it's very useful. Um, so find a tool that you like for generating documentation. If you want to have, uh, if you have a project that's mature enough where you feel like documentation is useful and um, follow their syntax. But this is kind of the standard one, I think that uh, is used pretty commonly for a few different tools. So this is why I'm gonna use this one I'm used to. Do whatever your tool recommends. So you do, you do at param, and then you do whatever the name of the parameter is. So RL in this case. And then after that, you put a description of what that is. So um, midline module from node. That's what that is. There's also a, okay, this next function will be a good example of, of the, another thing we can do. So let's go to this one. Let's do the same thing. So this run is pretty simple. It takes in three things. You take in a string, which is the source code that you want to run. So this can either be read off of the, the REPL, um, whatever, like if the user types in two plus two, then it'll be a string with two plus two in it. Um, and then there's a flag is what did this come from? Is this being run through the REPL or not? because uh, we handled that a little bit differently. And then there's also this thing called a scope. And we're not sure what a scope is yet, but uh, I'll explain it to you. We can go take a look at that file as well. The other thing you see here is the return. So that's what this colon at the end is. This is the return type of the function. So if you used to see, this would be like, um, if you write a function like this, then the documentation you might want to have for that would be, you'd say, OK, um, adds two numbers. This is this is a simple enough function. I argue you don't even need a comment, but what you do you, the way you'd write this is you okay param a first first int second int um, and then you can do an at return and so what is a return sum of a and b simple enough okay so if we want to do the same thing for our program here. Uh, so what does this run function do? Um, runs a string containing steel source code. And then at source or at param source, um, the string to run this or, oh. so the REPL um, true if running inside a REPL, false otherwise. And then scope, um, I'll keep changing this by mistake. Okay, the scope, so what the scope is, uh, is how, there's different ways you can implement this, but in my language, the scope is how um, variable scoping is handled. And so like, like, for example, if you try to, let's say we try to evaluate the user types A, and we wanna evaluate that expression. Um, well, let's start with something else first. Let's say we, we want to first, they type in two, okay? How do we evaluate two? Well, two is just a number, so we can just say, okay, two is two. That's simple. But what if they try to do something like A, like a variable name? 
Uh, how do we evaluate what the value of that is? Well, we need to look up in like a table somewhere to see was that variable defined? Like, do we need to do an error? This variable is undefined. Um, do, is there a value in there that we can print? You know, what's going on with this? Um, and so that the way that table or how that's stored is inside the scope object. So that's what that is. So scope, um, you can just say, I would just say something like containing scope for uh, code to run. And again, this might not immediately tip off the, the user to what it is, but every time we use a scope, we can't go on a paragraph long description of what a scope is, how to use it. Uh, so if the user really wants to go to scope, like what you can do is go to scope and put a comment in that file um, that describes what a scope is and how to use it. Um, and you can also, there uh, some documentation systems have like ways to link to, to other types. Okay, so you should really, for within this comment, sort of these parameters, you can sort of assume that the user understands what the types are involved. Because if they don't, they can just search for them in the project and find those. That's you really just can't, you don't want to try to explain everything in every single comment, because then you'll just have comments, so many comments, it'll be hard to read. Let's take a look at this actual code here and see if there's anything that we need to um, maybe comment. When I'm looking through code, you, you want to write your code in a way to avoid uh, writing comments. So if you have code that's confusing what it does, um, before you write comments to explain what it does, consider rewriting in a way that's just not confusing. We'll see some examples of this later on um, because I use this project to sort of teach myself how to do functional programming. So I used a lot, like I aggressively tried to favor functional programming constructs that are probably vague and unfamiliar to other people. Um, and I would recommend that you don't do that. So I thought it was a good learning experience, but you should try to write code that you think other people will be able to read. And that means don't, don't use like weird syntax or stuff that people don't sort of expect. So we'll see that later. Um, the only thing that, that might be um, sort of confusing here, so we can sort of see, okay, we're going to uh, set this source and see, is that like a global variable? Yeah, so we have this global variable here that's source. That's kind of interesting. Um, so we're gonna set the source into that, fine. Then set, print fn um, to console.log. And so, okay, we're gonna set the print function to the logging. That seems reasonable. Um, again, most of these functions, you can either read the source and figure out what they do, or they sort of have a name that describes what they do. So try to write function names that describe what it does. So we're gonna tokenize the source first and get tokens. Uh, and then parse to an AST. So this might be a good place to kind of describe how a, um, how like an, an interpreter or programming actually works on a high level. Uh, and this is something that like you shouldn't necessarily assume that the people know. So this might be something you put in your contributors file, um, but I think this is a, a fine place to put it like right here. So let's just put a little comment section here. Um, basically a, the way most traditional uh, compilers or interpreters for a language will work is you kind of have three phases. Um, first, you have a tokenizing phase. So that's when you read in the, the raw string and break it up into different parts. And this is where you kind of handle things like white space, because like, let's take just like a simple line of code, for example, like A equals three. You want this to be the same thing as A with two spaces equals three or A equals three, right? All of these need to sort of be parsed or tokenized into the same. We just want to know really all that matters here is the A, the equals, and the three. The spacing or you know whatever else is going on here um, doesn't doesn't really matter. And so to handle that, you first tokenize your source to sort of eliminate white space, uh, handle basic things like that. And that's also a point where you're going to go, okay, a is a variable because it's it's not a number or a string literal or something. This is a um, that's a number. If you have like string literals. That's how you go ahead and parse that into an actual string instead of just because you don't really need the quotes to represent that, right? You just need the text that's inside of it. So you do all those things. Um, that's what happens in your tokenized step. And then you, you'll get back a list of tokens. Then you, you parse those tokens. So after you have your set of tokens, um, you're going to take those and try to parse that into a tree that represents the structure of the program. So you might have like, at this point, you're going to have a list of things, right? And you might have an if token. Uh, and then a condition token, right? So you might have an if token and a condition token that's a Boolean. 
um, and then you know a block of code. Then you have you know an open brace, and then you have you know some more code. Then you have a closed brace, right? And you have all you have. This is sort of your list of things you've made. Well, now you need to actually recognize, okay, what is this thing where you have if and then a condition and a block with code in it? This is an if statement, and so that's called parsing. And so that's what this parse does. Um, it takes your tokens and turns it into like a a data structure that represents this. And then once we have that, um, there's if you're a compiler, what you do is you take that tree and you turn it into assembly um, or bytecode if you're doing like a, a VM, like Java, for example. Um, or if you're an interpreter, like this is just a very simple interpreter, then what you do is you just directly execute. So you read through those things and you directly execute it line by line. Okay, but this isn't background that necessarily I expect people writing this to know. So let's write a little comment here to sort of explain this. Um, and we don't need to do the double star because we're not trying to like document this on hover or something. This is just a, a general comment. First we, so first we tokenize um, the source this so okay so we're going to tokenize the source first we're going to parse this um into an ast which is abstract syntax tree um All right, and then last, we're going to use this loop to run each statement sequentially. So simple enough. And now, if if our user is sort of reading through this, right? And so they started in main, they kind of came here to this steel file. They kind of get this nice thing. They can see, okay, at a high level, this is how the program works. We're going to tokenize, and we're going to parse, and then we're going to loop through each statement in that that uh, abstract syntax tree and evaluate. You can see this expert eval here. That's to evaluate an expression. Uh, okay, the next line I think needs to comment is this one. Um, that's because anytime you're doing like weird things, so this this val e is not equal to undefined in this REPL, anytime, especially with these sort of complex conditions, it might it's hard for someone reading this to like see like, okay, what does this actually mean? Um, and so what we're trying to do here is if we are in the REPL, we're going to print out the value of whatever we just evaluated. Um, but also it has to be not undefined. So if we just evaluated like, a print statement, for example, um, or, or some statement that doesn't evaluate to anything, and we don't want to print undefined, that will just be confusing. We should just print nothing instead. So that's what this is supposed to do. So we can just say something like um, print if using REPL um, and if we have a value or if we Again, that just sort of makes the logic a little bit less obtuse what's happening there. Okay, and I think for, for the most part, um, this, this is a reasonable number of comments to sort of get this, get this uh, off the, get this file going. Um, oh, one thing we can do, we didn't mark the return here. So this, we do return a scope. Um, so return, you don't put a name because there is no name for your return necessarily right so you just you just put what the return is and like sort of what the point of it is so i'm going to say a scope um after all code has been evaluated okay all right uh let's go ahead and commit that that's a lot of so add let's say just add initial comments All right, so that is that. So next thing, why don't we, let me check in. Does, is everyone sort of understanding the rationale behind what we're doing? Uh, and, or do you have any questions about like so far what we're, going, what we're talking about?
before I move on. I think next we want to go to the, let's go to the scope file and actually see what's going on there. All right, now I don't see any questions. Uh, all right, so now let's head over to scope.ts here and see uh, what's happening here. Um, let's talk about self-documenting code. So you want your code, a lot of people talk about something called self-documenting code. And a lot of times people use that as an excuse to not write comments. Um, and to be fair, I've done that before as well. The idea behind self-documenting code is that you use names throughout your code that add enough meaning to what's happening that you can reduce or eliminate writing comments. Uh, so for example, scope, if you're familiar with lexical scope, um, and like sort of what that is in language or what scoping is in a language, then the idea of a scope won't be something that's unfamiliar to you. And so you might have sort of an intuitive sense of like how it works, what it's supposed to do. Um, some, I, you know, some people don't use variable names like A and B for your things. It might save you typing, but when you, when someone else comes to your code or even you like a week later or months later, right? I've been working on this project for like two years. So I don't remember all of this code. Some of this code could have been written months ago for me. And so I'm not going to remember what A and B stand for. So use names that are, are relevant to, to what's happening. Also, if you're using a language that doesn't have types, I like languages that are typed um, because you can sort of see, okay, bindings is like a math data structure. That's an associative data structure. Um, and then parent scope is just another scope. So you can sort of see based on the type what something is and get an idea of what it's supposed to be doing. If you use a language like just vanilla JavaScript or Python that doesn't have like type annotations or doesn't commonly use type annotations in the source, um, then it's even more crucial that you use, that you write good comments and that you name your variables properly so that people know what's being passed around. I think that I think types help a lot for readability, but again, I, I don't want to start like a holy war over typed and untyped languages, but just know that it's it's important no matter what, but it's especially important in languages that don't have type annotations. Um, so use expressive names. So like get, for example, this is going to get us a value out of the scope. So it makes a lot of sense what that would be um, sort of for. Something like get pair might be a little bit more confusing, especially because you have this value and then the blue and like what's going on here. So this might deserve something more of an explanation. And we also have set and set local, like what's the difference? So this file is realistically probably not very well written um, in terms of like the interface it exposes. It, they can do some things better. Um, so, but let's add some comments uh, to at least some of these. So you can sort of, I don't want to spend too much time in this one file, but just so you can sort of get a sense of what's going on. Let's comment this, this get pair, um, this get pair function first. And actually, before you even do that, let's comment the whole class. So you can comment a whole class. That is the thing that you can do. Um, and this is useful. I believe if you do this, let's see, let's try. And then you hover over one of these, it will actually, yeah, it'll give you the comment for the class there. And this works across file as well. So let's actually talk about what a scope is. I'm going to explain to you what a scope is in this program, uh, why you want to use it, et cetera. Basically, a scope, the way that this scope data structure works is um, in order to evaluate anything, you need to evaluate it in the context of some scope. And there's sort of two reasons for this. One, let's say we want to evaluate like the variable um, A, for example. We need to have a scope that we can look up and see if A is defined. Um, so that's what you can sort of see. Well, you have some assignments down here where we say you can see like you can't assign to an undefined. If we look up something and it's undefined, then we can't assign to it, which makes sense. Um, and so that's, sort of one purpose. The other purpose is we actually write to the scope because like, let's say we want to evaluate a statement like this, which actually that's the, this isn't a statement that works in my language, but just for example, right? And so we want to take A, we want to add two to A. Well, what needs to, how, do, how does this, this doesn't actually directly do anything except impact the, the sort of state of the program, right? Now, if we look up A later, it needs to be two more than it was before. Um, and so how does this work? That data is stored in the scope. So we can also write to the scope um, if we have assignments or just function calls that mutate data. All of this stuff is handled inside of a scope. So let's sort of think about what a comment for this, a good comment for this would be. 
Um, oh, the other thing to note about this is it's it's a uh, sort of a almost a recursive data structure. So every scope, well, there's one root scope. So there's one scope. Everything in your whole program executes inside of one scope that has by default nothing in it to start. Um, but as you like, if you call a function, for example, right? So we want this behavior that we all expect this to be true, just sort of from programming. We want this behavior that when you call a function at the beginning, you have, you can pass in some variables and you can use those variables inside that scope. But as soon as the function ends, that no longer works anymore. Um, so that's one thing that's sort of, we need to think about. And then the other thing we need to consider is in our, after that, uh, that function, right? So we can access variables we passed in as arguments, but we also need the ability to, to access variables out of scope as well. Like you might have a situation where you have like, right, we have some variable here and then we have a function that, um, something like this, where we're going to log out a value that's not in the current scope, right? So if we look in the current scope, there's no A, right? We didn't pass an A value in here. So we also need to be able to look up into higher scopes like, okay, look, so for basically how this works is if you try to look something up, we look in the current scope. If it's not there, we recursively look, look all the way back up to the top level scope to see if anybody um, has this defined before we spit out a message saying it's not defined. And so that's why you have this parent scope thing so that we can, whenever you make a scope, it needs to have a parent so you can look up and see, okay, does the parent have this variable that I don't have? So those are, that's basically, you basically understand what this does. There's a few other things that's going on here, but that's basically what this 100 lines of code does. So let's try to distill that into a short paragraph. Um, let's see. So a scope represents a lexical scope in the program. Um, each scope has a parent scope and used to resolve non-local variables. Um, we, it also has a set of bindings for local variables. So that's what this bindings is. That's a map from like a string, like a, a variable. Um, and then to this, we have a value Boolean uh, array here. We're gonna talk about what that is, but let's, let's also put that in here as well. So each scope has um, a set of bindings from identifiers and names. So if you're not familiar with the sort of term identifier, an identifier is just a like a variable or function or class name, right? So like in this program, scope is an identifier, map is an identifier, or, or no, those are types. Um, bindings would be an identifier. Parent scope would be an identifier. Um, and this function identifier is an identifier. It's just a, a name that represents a function or a class or a, a value, something like that. That's what an identifier is. Um, okay. So each scope has a set of bindings from identifiers to values. Well, actually, but it's not just to values, it's to value Boolean pairs. Okay, so let's briefly talk about this. What is this value Boolean pair? Basically, my language supports a like a, a feature where, by default, when you assign something, it's immutable, so you can't reassign to it later. So that's why I was saying if you try to do this, like if you if you have a equals two and then you try to add two to it like this, it won't let you. Anytime you use the equal sign, uh, those things are equal forever and always. Um, so we probably should talk about that in here somewhere. Um, so that's what this value boolean pair is. So we have a value is just a, a different value. If you hover over it at the bottom, you can sort of see the different things it could be. It could be a string, it could be a number, it could be a Boolean. Um, oh no, no, go away keynote. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, it could, so it could be a, it could be a string, could be a number, could be a Boolean, um, or it could be this STL function is a steel function. So that's a, an object that sort of represents a function in the language or it could be a list of values, right? Because we could have an array. So that's what that is. And then Boolean is whether or not it's immutable. So if this is true, then, then we can't change it if it's, so that has to be stored in the scope as well. Cause like, how do you know if you can assign to it or whatnot? 
Um, so that that's what this Boolean is. It's whether if it's true, you can't you it's immutable, you can't change it. If it's false, you can change it. Okay. Um, the value represents uh, any possible value. A variable could have the Boolean uh, is true if the value is mutable or immutable and false if the value can be changed. Um, oh, and then we also need to talk about the parent. So each scope also has a parent. All right. And, oh, that didn't. That's, I think that's a pretty good comment for this whole thing. Let's take a look at some of these, like this get pair function. Um, so maybe this makes more sense with the difference between these, this get and get pair are now. Get will just get you the value. You can see the return type is just a value, whereas get pair will get you the value and also um, that Boolean. If you look at get, it's actually just a very thin wrapper around get pair. Um, it'll get the pair, check if it's null. And so I think this is fairly readable. Let's just comment get pair. That's a con the, especially since the get pair is not really like a standard thing to say. It might be confusing to some people. Um, so get pair looks up um, an identifier in the current scope and returns the value and whether it is immutable as a pair. Um, if, if, the, if the identifier is invalid, um, returns null. Right. And I know I have some bad spelling here. Let's fix that. All right. So that's pretty good here. Let's add our param. So remember, we want to comment our param. So param identifier um, name to look up and then return a pair containing the value and immutability status. That's spelled right. That's not right either. Or null. All right. And now, if you come, remember, what's useful about this is now, as you hover over it later, you get all of this information um, about what the function does, what are the things you need to pass in, how to use it. This is great. Um, and so that's that's sort of the idea behind this. We could comment the rest of this stuff, but I don't want to spend uh, too much time talking about that. Let's talk about, I know I want to talk about how you want to write, try to write code where you don't need to write comments. Um, so let's see if I can find uh, use of, I want to find a use of reduce in this. Yeah, this is fine. Or let's do, yeah, let's do this. Okay, so now you can see we're in interpreter.ts here. So this is the, the main guts of the, the whole program. You can see it's one of the longest files, 300, file, 300 lines long. Um, and what I've done here is I've used sort of this functional pattern. So in functional programming, there's this function called like array.reduce. Uh, you can call it on an array. And it works sort of like a weird for loop. Um, but this is not probably something, unless you're aware of functional programming, you've done a lot of programming with, with functional patterns before, Reduce is probably not something that you're aware of. Um, and even though reduce is great and it's, it's very useful for certain sorts of things, um, just the fact that it's not well known, in my opinion, is enough to just strike it from your code. Unless it makes things substantially easier, it's going to make things harder for most people to read. The same, I tend to believe the same thing about the ternary operator. So if you've used, some of you might not even know what that is. Uh, if you've used the ternary operator before, basically it works like this. Um, 
right? So you maybe say, I don't know, uh, speech equals. So leaving. Oh, so you should be reversed. Or here, let's let's do it this way. Okay. So this is an example of using a ternary operator. Uh, right, so what we're going to do is it, it works a lot like sort of an if else, but you can use the value of it, you can assign the value of it to a variable or use it as the input to something else. Um, so we're going to check this variable is leaving and we're going to do the opposite of that. So if we're not leaving, then that's this question mark marks the end of the if, then this string needs to be high, right? So we must be arriving. Um, and then this colon, and then this is the else sort of, otherwise by. But, and so maybe you're familiar with ternary and you love ternary and it's so great. But if your team or other people you work with aren't familiar with this, then this will just leave people more confused, especially if you, some people like chain ternaries. And so like they do another condition here um, and then two more things, right? Um, and this can very quickly reach a, a point where unless you sort of originally wrote it or you're very familiar with ternaries, this doesn't make sense. And I think ternaries are great, okay? I'll be one of the first people to say I love ternaries. I think it's a very concise way to express this idea. Um, but the fact of the matter is most people just don't use them regularly and aren't familiar with them. So I don't recommend you use this. Um, what, you, what you should, what I'd recommend doing instead is sort of a, a basic if. So just set a variable to nothing or set it to null and then do, because everyone knows what this means. And yes, is it is it more verbose? Yes, but unless unless you feel like um, people are going to understand it, I would lean more towards doing this instead of the ternary. Ternary is one of the ones that's on the edge though, because a, a good number of people know it, and it does tend to save a lot. Look at this one line versus like what five, one, two, three, four, five, six lines. Um, so it does save a lot of code. You get a lot of value there, and there's something to be said for concise code. But reduce is an example of one that I think is heavily in the camp of most people do not understand it, what it does, how it works. Um, so, so I'm sorry, I'm going to recommend you don't use it. Um, let's see, anything in the chat? Yes, you can use ternaries within other ternaries. Yeah, it's, it's actually, in fact, we can see if I have any. Um, hold on, let's see if we have any in this. Hmm. Maybe tokenizer here. I might have a ternary. Let's see. Yeah, I do have some ternaries in here, but you can actually, yeah, here's an example right here. Um, so this is this is the the tokenizer. So this is basically it's going character by character and like deciding how to parse this. If we reach an equal, we need to actually make different tokens depending on what, it, what comes up next. So if we just match an equal, um, we check, do we match another equal? And if we match that, then we're going to give back an equal equal token um, for like, that's probably for a comparison. And okay, otherwise let's see if we match greater than because then we're going to make the, the right double arrow um, because that actually, if you do equal that, it looks sort of like a right double arrow. And that actually does mean something in this language, but, and then, okay, otherwise we just have a regular old equals. So yes, you can nest ternaries. Um, but again, this is probably not if you're looking at this and you don't know what ternaries are, you're just going to be confused. So it's probably not necessarily the best style. Um, this is a personal project, so it wasn't as huge of a deal, but, and ternary is one that I think enough people are becoming aware of it that it might be okay to use. It does look very clean, um, but reduce is definitely a bad example. So let's let's fix this reduce because reduce is, is oh, this is the wrong file. Uh, let's go back. What file was that in? That was the interpreter file. Okay. Reduce is one that most people do not understand. Like you can even try to look at the, um, like if, if even if you try to read the docs for this, like it's super long and like very confusing. Um, it's just better avoided. So let's just rewrite this as a for loop because that's basically what it does. Um, and what you can see, this is actually an, this STL eval is basically just evaluating a string. So you can pass any string into this and a scope, whatever the current scope you're evaluating in, and then it will tokenize it, it will parse it, you have the tree, and then you can iterate through that tree and evaluate each statement to figure out what the value of this is. 
Um, so let's just replace it with the for loop. So what we can do, uh, so this, this also might be unfamiliar syntax, but I think it's more familiar than to people than reduce. You can also do a regular for, because almost everyone's familiar with that. Um, but I think that this is, this is not too much of a stretch to assume that someone who's using like modern TypeScript or JavaScript will know about the fancy for loop where you can avoid using I. So I think this is a, a good balance between uh, conciseness and, and readability. Okay, so for each expression, what do we want to do? Well, what we kind of, what we need to do here is we need to evaluate the expression. So we pass that expression in, and then we also need to evaluate the scope or pass in the scope that we're, we currently have. So I'll pass that in there. Um, but we need to keep track of the scope because it could change after each possible uh, evaluation. Like as soon as we evaluate an assignment, if we evaluate, again, this doesn't work. So the assignments look different in this language. But if you evaluate this, the scope now changed. And if we look up A, we need to look up a different value. So you need to keep track of the scope at all times. Um, so we'll make this current scope and set it initially to scope. And then if we look at uh, expert eval, well, actually it's down here, but what it returns is it gives you back an, a scoped value. And a scoped value is actually just, uh, it's just a, the value and then a scope. It's just that same pair. That's, this is also probably a bad, I probably should replace these as well because it's sort of is confusing, but um, so we get back that pair. So let's actually destructure that. Um, so we can get value and then new scope. If you're not familiar with the, um, this sort of destructuring syntax, again, this is something like maybe you should avoid. Basically, basically what it does is, um, let's do something like that. Basically what this does is it'll do this for you, but it does all this in one line. And I just think this is, enough of a savings that if you don't know about it, then I'm going to assume that you're going to look this up and figure it out. It lets you basically take an array and then unpack it sort of into variable names all in one step. So instead of having to get back the array and then look at the zeros and then look at the first and grab those out, you can just sort of say, okay, the array should look like this. Just take those item out, items out in order. And so I think that's great. Um, so let's do that. But again, this could be in the realm of syntax people don't understand. So maybe for your project, you want to avoid this. I think in general, this is something you should know, though, uh, more so than reduce. So I'm going to go ahead and use it. So we pull that out. Um, and then let's see what's going on with this get state here. This is basically just a way to pull out the, um, the scope. So we don't really need to worry about that. And then what we need to do after this is we need to we need to set the current scope equal to the new scope that we just pulled out of there. And then this value, we don't really care what the value of the expression is um, unless it's the last expression. So the way that my language works is whenever you evaluate a, um, a series of expressions, whatever the last expression is, is the value of the whole thing. So if you evaluate um, you know, two or you do a, a equals four, and again, this isn't how it actually ends up looking. Um, let me just write the way it would look. So the way you do an assignment in my language is this, this back arrow. Because I think that makes sort of more conceptual sense before it goes into the A. But OK, so you do that. Um, and then maybe you, you, you add 2 to that. Um, and then at the very end, you have A plus 2. So if you evaluate this whole chunk of code, what you end up getting is the value of this last expression. And there's different ways to do this, but this is how I do it. Um, so if we evaluate this, it's going to be four, and then we add two, so there's going to be six and a, and then six plus two is eight. So this whole thing should evaluate eight. So how do we do that? We just need to keep track of the current value. And then here, we just need to always set this value, set that to the, or the other way around, current value, this value. Um, and then when we finish the loop on the last thing, we'll have the current value in this variable here. Okay. So we do this, um, and then at the very end of this, we need to return a scoped value. And remember, that's just a scope value pair. So that's just the, the things that we end up with. So we return our current value and current scope. 
And now we should be able to get rid of this. And so you can see this is actually more concise to do it this way, less lines of code. Um, but I would argue this is much more readable for the vast majority of people. You have a hope of sort of understanding what this means compared to this one, which is definitely very obfuscated and hard to understand. Um, so I'd say prefer this. And then if you do things like this, you don't need to comment and say, um, evaluates and returns last scope and value because you can people can sort of read this and understand what it does. The other danger of writing comments like this, if you are going to do weird things and write comments like this, is if you change the code, uh, you can end up with comments that are lies. And this has actually happened to me before. I wrote comments and then changed the code. And later on, when I went back and I read those comments, I just assumed the comments were telling the truth. And then that gave me false assumptions about what the function actually did, how it actually worked. And I spent a lot of time searching for a problem that was in that function because I thought, oh, it's not in that function. You know, it, the comment says that it does this uh, when it actually wasn't true. Um, so that's another reason to limit comments. If you force people to actually read the code, then they will, they will understand, they'll have to understand how it works. Whereas if you write comments, they could get out of date and then um, nobody will really know whether or not they're still true. And they can fall in a trap like that. What I also recommend you do is write tests. I'm not going to talk about that a lot in this workshop because there just isn't time. Um, but if you write tests, then you can, that's a, another way to verify your code just what you think. So, oh, uh oh. We maybe change some things that uh, should be, shouldn't be broken. I'm not sure. This stuff may have been broken before, though, too. Let's see. Let's let's see if this is broken before. But if you write tests, um, oh no, it worked before. Okay, so this is a great example of tests helping you. Okay, so I have 103 unit tests. Um, the way a test works is you kind of run some, like you run a function, and you can kind of see, okay, does this code re return the expected result? Does it do the expected things? And so then if you make changes like this, um, you can see, so apparently whatever I did isn't actually equivalent because tests no longer work anymore. Hmm, interesting. Okay, let's take a look at this more closely. Well, let's, let's actually look, what did we actually change? Is it just this? We just added comments here, yep. Okay, so it has to be this. Yeah, so this is a great example is if I had a comment of what it did before, and then I just changed this and I didn't have tests and I committed it, then, well, apparently in how many, 32 cases that 32 of my test cases, it no longer actually does what it's supposed to do. <laughs> um, so let's see if we can figure out why this is broken. Uh, not defined. I think it has something to Oh, oh, okay. Our problem here is this. So our initial scope, we just kept passing our initial scope in every time. We need to always pass in the current scope. Let's try that. Yeah, tests are a lifesaver, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> that was the problem, great. Um, tests are an absolute lifesaver. I, if you do any project at scale, I strongly recommend you look into doing unit tests. Again, I wish I had time to like talk about them at length here, but I don't. Um, but they'll, they'll save you from doing things like this to yourself, which is very easy to do in a complex code base. Okay. Um, refactor to remove reduce. Okay. Um, so that's nice. Remove reduce here. Why don't we actually go ahead and write a doc string for this as well? Um, so we have this string based eval for steel, which is like mm, maybe not the best description of this evaluates um, some given source code in the context of the given scope. A param source, um, oh, didn't do the second stuff. String to eval, and then our scope would be um, to evaluate 
source in. And then return. So we return pair of resultant uh, value and scope. Add 344. I delete something on 344. Oh, it's because, yeah, okay. All right, so that's a pretty good comment for that. Um, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Are there any questions about any of that? So, well, basically, what I'm saying is I prefer language constructs that people are going to be familiar, more likely to be familiar with. But you want to strike a balance between conciseness and and um, and like complexity in your. You, you want it to be both concise but also also readable. So like, don't be like, well, you know, some some people might not know what a function is or how to use it. So I'm just going to write all my code in main. Um, you know, that you can use it sort of to justify almost anything. But what I'm mainly saying is try to avoid features that aren't as mainstream or weird syntaxes or just weird ways of doing things. I think a lot of like if you're in CS1 or, or CS2 and you're doing like algorithms or data structures, a lot of times those sorts of structures do very clever things uh, to achieve the performance and to be the most optimized they can be. Um, but if you read any standard library uh, where people actually implement like, you know, like implement, like if you go look up Python's source code for, for a sorting method, it is extensively commented. There's, you know, dozens, hundreds of lines of comments that explain how the sort works, how everything uh, with regard to that works, because it does, you know, sort of some unintuitive things or things that might be very confusing. Um, in general, I think most code that you write can be pretty straightforward. If you read this function, it kind of makes sense. We're going to take the source, tokenize it, parse it, and now we have the, the, the tree to run. We're going to set up our scope and value. Then we're going to iterate through each uh, expression in our tree, evaluate that and whatever the current scope is, update all the values, and then return the results of all this. And this is pretty straightforward, as long as you don't use like a reduce or something weird. Um, but there are, sometimes you need performance, so you have to optimize and do things in a strange way. Um, or, or you just have like a, an, an algorithm or something that is, is not intuitive. You have to do some kind of hack to make it work or using functions you know, that you've imported from a library or something and you're not sure how it works. And so recommend you comment if you do have to do something like that. Okay, we have a question. What if you were the rookie in a veteran team that uses the weird funky code? Should you learn their way or write the more concise way? Um, well, oh, so I guess in my experience, generally the reason people write things in a weird way is because that is the more concise way. So like the only reason, well, I was using reduce partially to sort of force myself to learn how reduce worked. So the reason I was doing this is because I didn't understand reduce and I wanted to force myself to understand it. So throughout this project, I use reduce extensively. I have almost no loops. Like you can look through, there are very few loops. There's lots of like, here's a reduce. Um, there are lots and lots of reduces in this project. Reduce, reduce, I guess he's the only two in this file. Um, there are lots of reduces in this, in this project uh, and very few loops. For that reason, I was trying to force myself to learn it. But if you are a rookie on a veteran team that is using these weird constructs, I rec like learn what they are. Because some of them, like for this, for this, for example, or like ternary, we could all use, if everyone understood what ternary was, then we could all use it. And it would be great because I think Turner, it's, it's cleaner than the if statement, fewer lines of code. Um, and if you understand it, I think it's, it's, it's pretty intuitive. But I'm just saying a lot of people don't understand it. So you should always try to make sure that people can always understand your code. Um, but if you are a beginner and you're not familiar with these things, don't use this as an excuse to never learn them. I recommend you learn all these different things because if we all learn it, then we can all use it, which is great. Um, so that's what I would say about that. Uh, try and always try to keep things as concise as you can. Like this, for example, especially when it enhances the readability. I think this kind of a loop where you say, okay, for each uh, expression that's in this, um, in this tree, do this thing. We don't need an I. And if we change this to a, if we change this to an I style loop, which you can do, this is, this is and this is a valid way to do it. And some might say this is like, a more, you know, going to be a more common denominator um, than doing it the other way. 
right? And then all you'd have to do is do this. Um, but I think this idea of having this ASTI is already sort of, it's like another level of indirection because it's not really, you have to think about, okay, if I index this array, what val what kind of value do I get back? And you don't get to use, whereas if you do it this way, I think this is actually more readable because you're saying, okay, it is an expression that we're getting back. And now this reads very naturally. We're gonna evaluate an expression. Oh, we're passing in the expression, not some abstract array to reference. Um, and so I try to try to look for features that you can do that. It's, it's, it's often good to try to make your code more concise, but just what I'm saying is don't get carried away um, and use, use things that you know, no one else uses or that are just more uncommon. But still, I mean, I still recommend learning them. I know all kinds of weird syntax and I love to show people like, hey, you know, look at this cool new syntax. If you have a small team, you can just teach people, which is great. Um, but in general, I'd say just stay away because you want to be careful. So let's add that. Um, what is this SDL allow? Okay. Yeah, hopefully that makes some sense. If you are a beginner, like go out and learn all the things. I, I highly recommend it, you know, because if we all learn reduce, then we can all use reduce and that would be great. And I, I love reduce, but, but it's just, it's not at the point of adoption that enough people understand what it is um, to where it can be useful. Another sort of instance of this, let me see if I can find, let's look for ifs. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Another example where this comes up a lot is with if statements. Um, yeah, this is actually a great example. So let's take a look at Complex conditions are a case where this sort of thing comes up. So we've already looked at a complex condition before and we're like, okay, you can put a comment above to describe what it does. But sometimes the best thing to do is to wrap the logic into a function. So you can sort of see here, um, this at end, before I had this, this at end function is sort of a result of, of that uh, sort of thing. So what this does is basically it, um, it checks. So the way that we can tell this is part of the, the parser. Okay. So we have the tokens, we're reading the tokens and trying to parse it into if statements, uh, function declarations, assignment statements, all the different things. Right. Um, and so we're going to check, okay, is our current thing beyond the end of our, are we at the end of our array or are we beyond the end of the array? If that's true, um, then we're at the end. Because all this add end function is tells us, okay, we're at the end of parsing, like there's no more content to parse, we need to stop. That's what this is used for. And there's also this, I, this also this thing we can do is, is at the very end of the, the, my tokenizer always puts this token type dot EOF for end of file as the very last token. So we can also check if this EOF is the last token. And we kind of need to check the way it works currently, which is maybe bad, but the way it works currently is you kind of have to check both because one of them might be true and the other one might not be depending on how different things happen. Um, and so but what I had before is like, anytime I need to check the end, I would have to do this, this whole thing. So like right here, I would have to, to put all of this into the condition. Um, and this, it just gets annoying to constantly type this out. And you have to remember to put the parentheses. It makes these super long lines that are like completely unreadable. And you can put a comment and say, um, you know, checks if we're at the end um, or if we, because the other reason, so this match type matches a kind of token. So if we're at the end, then we need to just say, okay, we're at the end, we're done. But we also need to check, hey, can we actually match that token? So we look and see, is the next tokens type the right type? Um, so checks if we're at the end or if we match the token. And this is one way to do it. But this is an example where you can write self-documenting code. So instead of doing, instead of writing a comment to explain your ridiculously long condition, just consider refactoring your condition to be more understandable. So we get rid of this comment, right? And wrap up all that logic that really means if we're at the end into an actual function that does that. And now you can sort of read through this and it makes a lot more sense. Um, and this sort of thing comes up a lot where you have like long conditions, and you know, the function is, is pretty simple. 
And this is where you can put the comment and you can say, okay, we're going to check if the counters be beyond the end of the tokens array, then we're at UF, or if we're at UF, we're at UF, right? We can have that, but we can save ourselves um, that kind of mental overhead of having to think about that as long as our function is written correctly, of course. Um, there's always the chance you have bugs in your function, but so that's that's also what people mean when they say self-documenting code. Do things write functions that explain what they are, so you don't need to put comments. Use variable names that say what they are. Intermediary variables is another great thing. Um, so let's see. Let me see if I can find an example of this. Probably in here would be a good. Yeah. Okay. So this function right here um, is. Is kind of the meat of, of the program. So this expert eval can evaluate any expression that's been already parsed in a scope. Um, and it's actually probably too long. It's it probably does need to be like refactored into a different way. Yeah, it's extremely long. Basically, what you can see what it does is it checks through and sees what the type of each of the expression is and then does the right thing. So let's take a look at just say like an if statement. Yeah. Okay. So we take a look at this if statement. So what we do is we read, we evaluate. The first thing we do for the if is evaluate the condition um, in our current scope. And then we get a new scope and then a variable that should be a Boolean. Um, but remember, the user could do something bad, like you know if five or whatever. Um, and so we need to actually check to make sure, at least in my language, there's different ways you can do it. But in my language, you need to check if we need to check to make sure that they actually put a, a Boolean there and not like a number or a string or something. Um, so that's what this assert bool does. So we're going to assert, okay, if we don't assert that it's a bool, then we're going to throw a, we're going to throw an exception or throw this panic. It doesn't evaluate. And that's great. Um, otherwise, we're going to, we're going to check the value. And if it's true, we're going to evaluate the body. So that's the main if. If it's not true, um, if it's not true and if the, the else body is, isn't null, so if we actually do have an else, because sometimes you just have an if with no else, then we're gonna evaluate the else body. Um, but, so you can see that having what you can, what you can do in some cases is like directly inline a, a value. So for example, you could, um, this is maybe not the best example. Let me see if there's one. Sometimes you have a case where you, let's see. Yeah, okay, this might be a good case here. Um, so what you could do here is you could take this array and just inline it directly to where it's used. But as soon as you start getting like multiple nested function calls like this, it often becomes confusing what values actually are. So it's often wise, even if it makes more lines to extract a call. So like we're gonna evaluate this, um, this expression and we'll get back in our array is maybe not the best name, but um, we could say, I don't know, uh, value scope pair, something like that. Um, if you can extract this, extract, just extracting this to a variable and giving yourself an opportunity to name what it is uh, can often be useful just for documentation purposes. Because if you inline everything, then it gets the you have to kind of like you have to start thinking like okay, if I you have to start thinking like okay, if I evaluate this, what does it evaluate to, and then like what kind of thing is it passing into this other function? Um, whereas if you have sort of multiple lines where you like call a function, you store the value, and then use that value next, there's less indirection. You can kind of think more directly. Like you can sort of confirm each line manually if you're debugging. So. We're going to evaluate this expression and get back this array that has a scope and a value in it. Okay, then we're going to get the value out of the array and we're going to put that in value. This is another, this is a good example, right? We could just, where do we use this case value? We could just do this get val array right here. But now we have to think, okay, if equal get val and this match extra value, like now you have to think like, okay, what is get val doing? What does this array actually contain? Um, so it's, it's better to just extract this to case value. And now you can sort of see, um, you can, if you understand what the case value is in context, like that name, you can use that name basically as a form of documentation. So that's, that's sort of, um, hopefully that sort of gives you the idea of what like a self-documenting self-documenting code should be. And the last thing I wanna talk about 
um, today is, is like fix me's and to do's. So I use these a lot. Uh, my editor highlights them, most editors will. The, there's, there's lots of different ones you can use, but the main ones that people use are fix me and um, to do. And these are comments that sort of, they sort of point out a similar thing, but there's like a subtle distinction. Some people just use to do all the time or just fix me for everything. But basically what these are is um, reminders to yourself um, of things that like need to be implemented or improved. So I usually use to do for things that I intend to implement. Like it's, it's code that just doesn't exist. And what's great about this is you can search through the project for that capital to do and find all of the things that you meant to, to do. So like, for example, we can go to tokenizer here um, and go to line 208 and see, okay, we wanted to implement a string interpolation. Um, and that's like, that's uh, one of those strings where you can do like this sort of thing. That's what this is supposed to do. So that, and that code doesn't exist. So I usually use to do's for code that doesn't exist, but should exist. And then fix me is a much more common, um, at least in my code. Fix me's are like, okay, we have this code. It mostly works, um, but there's, we need to think more about like how we want to implement this, or if this is sort of a hack, like sometimes they'll say like, fix me, this is a hack, like, yeah, right here, 171. Um, so let's go to that and see what's going on there. Fix me, hack we need to address. Oh, and so this, what's happening here is in our if statement, if we evaluate the condition and it's true, we're going to do the, the main body. If, if it's false and we have an else body, we're going to evaluate the else. And then otherwise, okay, so this, the hack here is that if we evaluate an if statement um, and we need to return what the value of the statement is, but it ended up being false and we evaluated nothing, then what do we return as like the value of the statement? Because like in my language, you can do something like, um, here, let's, you can do something like, um, Right, so th I, this is, I think, a better alternative to ternary. Um, this ha doesn't have a lot to do with clean code necessarily, but instead of having ternary, you can have this, okay, if true, or you can put any condition here, then a value, else a different value. But the problem we run into is what if you do this, and then the condition is false. So currently we just return null, but this definitely breaks things. So that's why I put the fix me here, because I'm not sure exactly how we want it. We probably should like throw an error or something, but. At the time, I just didn't have the time to think about how I wanted to resolve this, but I wanted to mark that, like, okay, there's clearly a problem here that needs to be addressed. So that's what I use fix me for. And those are great because then, you know, as you're working on your code and you're like, okay, I think things are in a good place. What are some things I need to like improve? And you can go through and look at all your fix me's and, and resolve those. Okay. Um, so with that, that's basically all I wanted to cover. Are there any questions about? writing clean code, uh, documentation, uh, markdown. If not, I'll go ahead and stop recording. Uh, thank you for coming.